Hey team, Connor from HBA here. This is what's been happening over the last couple of weeks. Uh, if we just jump onto my computer screen, I've got a CAD model open here in Fusion 360. And this is for the rear of our K20 powered Honda CRX uh, endurance race car that's been an ongoing build over the last six months or so. And we've been giving updates on this as we go in the webinar. So there's plenty of information around on that. But one of the big projects for this, or one of the main issues we were having was that we were uh, wearing out or going through rear wheel bearings very quickly, essentially because um, there was a lot more load going through the wheel bearings uh, with the slicks and things like that. Um, and the original Honda EF wheel bearings just weren't up to the task. So this season, uh, or in preparation for next season rather, we're actually looking at upgrading the rear wheel bearings. And at the same time, we're moving to a 5 by 114.3 uh, wheel um, stud pattern um, for the newer wheels and we're upgrading the front wheel bearings as well but we'll just focus on the rear one today so we've actually got some um, I'll just hide some things here we've got some rear hubs off I think it's a Honda Odyssey uh, from my memory and I'll just hide the wizard disc brake disc there so you can see here the hub for the Honda Odyssey and that bolts on here uh, as a kind of, there's four bolts that bolt onto this. But essentially what we've got here is a 3D scan of the trailing arm, I guess it is, from the EF CRX. Um, so that's a 3D scan we took and we've brought that into CAD as a mesh file. And we essentially needed a way of adapting the... Um, Odyssey hub here or wheel bearing carrier to that control arm because originally I don't have a photo a photo of it but there's usually a spindle that comes out here and then the um, original Honda Civic hub would slide over that spindle with the wheel bearings housed in that. So removing that spindle um, we then can adapt this uh, Odyssey hub to the rear trailing arm uh, so that involved it's a bit of an exercise in packaging this one um, trying to fit a lot of things in the same space because essentially we need to yeah adapt the hub to the trailing arm we're also wanting to use a wheel speed sensor which is somewhat related to what we're going to be talking about in today's webinar um, and then we also need to have the brake disc obviously there and the caliper as well so we need a, a caliper bracket there and um, because it's a front wheel drive Honda relatively small rear uh, brakes disc brakes used on it um, and there's quite minimal amount of room inside that to fit everything um, and then also just packaging that under. We're running a 17 inch wheel, but uh, yeah, it's obviously this all needs to fit inside that wheel. Um, so yeah, basically we've got there the rear trailing arm and then this adapter piece, which I'll show you more of in a moment, then the hub. Uh, and then if we zoom in here, we have the Hall Effect uh, wheel speed sensor. Uh, and then we have also a tone ring in there, which is all hidden away and uh, also yeah our brake caliper bracket there as well so fitting that all into quite a small place um, so what's happened over the last week just jump over here is uh, our fabricator and machinist uh, Jimmy has come up with these or oh, we designed these made some drawings provided them to him and then these have been machined out of steel billet steel uh, to ensure they are strong enough so we'd obviously much prefer using aluminium in this case but because of this recess here and then uh, how this is machined on the back here um, that's quite a small thickness through that section and we're just a little bit worried about the strength um, through that part where the spigots into the uh, trailing arm <coughs> so we thought it would be best to go with steel in this case at least as a proof of concept um, and saying that these uh, bolt holes one two oh just jump back to that this one here 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 and there's one behind this um, those parts would be uh, where it bolts to the trailing arm so I'll just jump back to this model here so through these four holes in the back here and then we have that kind of spigot piece extend through there um, if I 
just make a section view through that plane you can kind of see that there so this is the thickness I was worried about through here but it is fastened through the back of these as well like the um, normal carrier for the spindle would be um, so that all ties into there and then you can see this pink part here is the hub um, that spigots into that and then is fixed with those four bolts so if I jump back to here you can see a photo of the hub sitting on that there um, another photo so this little relief here is basically for the wires for the hall effect sensor for the wheel speed sensor to come out of um, and then if I jump down again we can see it there on the actual rear trailing arm so these are just sandblasted at the moment uh, we're actually getting them powder coated um, and at the same time uh, we're also using the honed uh, roll center um, correction kit for uh, dropping that lower control arm down for lowered ride height and then we also have these PCI uh, spherical bearings for one of the trailing arm mounts here we also have the PCI um, upper control arm and the toe arm that goes at the front of this so removing all the rubber bushings in it and changing to spherical bearings basically to reduce compliance um, and you can see on the back of the trailing arm here as well it's been reinforced with the honed uh, trailing arm reinforcement plate there as well uh, and then that's just a bit of a photo of how that spigot part goes through the trailing arm and meets the back there to kind of sandwich it all together and make a really strong and stiff part. So yeah, those uh, wheel, the hubs are for the Honda Odyssey is maybe in stock form about double the weight of our CRX. So they should be more than up to the task of handling that and we shouldn't hopefully have any issues with rear wheel bearings moving forward. So we'll just move on from that and jump over to our giveaway. So I'll get Geordie to drop the link for this in the chat. Um, but this is our giveaway There's uh, this week. So there's eight days left to enter and that's for the FuelTech FT600, um, which is an ECU and dash. And then that's combined with um, the HPA VIP package as well. So a suite of HPA training courses. Um, so the FuelTech FT600, that's a ECU and DASH all in one and it allows for sequential injection and ignition up to 12 cylinders. Um, there's also uh, programmable, programmable displays in it um, and then the, the usual batch of uh, modern functions uh, in ECUs these days. So yeah, things like our data logging and uh, also the ability to use drive-by-wire and endless other functions. So head along to that and you can enter for that. It uh, doesn't cost anything to enter. Um, and yeah, eight days left. So check that out and yeah, we'll move on from that. So over on our YouTube channel, uh, this is a video uh, from Andre talking to Mike from Dusseld Designs from Optima Streetcar Challenge uh, last year, I think. Um, so in this, they're talking about the Ford Mustang that's been basically uh, modified for Time Attack. And there's a lot of discussion in this video about what it takes to, uh, or the considerations around using a classic car for Time Attack and what's needed to bring it up to the standard to be able to compete with uh, modern production cars as well. Um, so this Mustang in particular, it's had uh, the front end suspension has been converted to a double wishbone um, and then the rear end is still a solid axle although it's been converted to a full floating hub assembly um, allowing for a bit of camber and toe to be uh, added. Um, and it also uses a watts link as well so uh, there's room for adjustment with uh, the roll center and the in instant centers and they discuss in this uh, interview quite a lot about their considerations around tuning those um, and the kind of process they use uh, to go about them uh, and some 
kind of ideas around those and the tuning and the influences they have on the vehicle dynamics as well. But one of the key points of this is, of course, talking about the engine. Um, they are using the Ford Windsor V8 in this, but it is uh, with the addition of two turbochargers. And one of the key things is they are using uh, the electronic wastegates. So it's quite an interesting discussion here. Um, they dive into some considerations around using those waste gates, um, but also around using um, the wastegate, actually keeping the wastegate open until the turbo uh, spools essentially to, or just probably before the turbo is, is ready to spool. Um, and they've found from some testing that reducing the exhaust pressure um, helps the pressure differential across the cylinder and that's actually um, helped with the low end torque when they're off boost and then they're closing the wastegate uh, when the boost comes on and then obviously opening the wastegate up top as well to uh, control the boost pressure. So quite an interesting discussion there, that's just on our YouTube channel um, and I'll try to get Jordy to drop the link to that in the chat as well. Uh, so, moving on to the next thing uh, is our courses. So, one of the most recent courses that's gone up, I'll just jump over to that here, is our brake system design and optimization course. Um, I'll just mute this. So this, uh, we'll jump down to the curriculum to get you a better understanding of what's involved in this. So in this course, we cover all the fundamentals of brake system operation in an automotive context and what's also important uh, in a motorsport performance automotive application as well. So first we cover all the fundamentals, how the hydraulics work, brake friction, um, as well as things like longitudinal tyre forces and that kind of feeds into brake bias as well. And we also discuss uh, brake system compliance in that. Um, and then we move into brake system components. So that's all the components, well, or most of the components that you'd see in any production vehicle and all the components that would be used in a motorsport or performance automotive application. Um, things like pedal boxes and master cylinders, but all the way through to cooling, uh, talking about brake fluids as well. ABS systems also included in that. So every component basically involved in a braking system. And then we move on to discuss measurements here. So uh, we got temperature, pressure, and position measurements, all the measurements that are really gonna be required to optimize your braking system and really understand what's happening with the braking system uh, when you're out on track or uh, testing or racing. Um, and that doesn't just involve the use of sensors as well, it, it involves other measurement, uh, other ways of gaining data, things like uh, brake disc paint. Um, temperature probes in the pit, things like that. And then we move on to our brake system design, which is maybe one of the core uh, parts of this course. Um, and we kind of step through the, the full process of designing a brake system from scratch, but also what you'd need to understand if you are analyzing uh, an existing brake system and trying to find potential flaws uh, in the system. Um, and basically a best process to follow to completely understand that. And um, that just brings us here to the HPA brake system calculator. So I'll just jump over to this. And this is at the moment um, in a spreadsheet format, which you can download from the course, but um, in the future it will also be up on our website. So using this calculator, it does a lot of the heavy lifting for us, which we did learn in the previous modules, but it, it just makes the... Um, makes it a bit lighter on the calculations. There's quite a lot of calculations that go into this and this spreadsheet does a lot of it for us. So in the spreadsheet, we can input all the things like uh, vehicle data, things like the wheelbase, the mass, uh, the weight distribution, things like that. Everything that has an influence on the braking performance of the car. Um, and also things like the, uh, intent, uh, the target pedal ratio or the pedal ratio that we intend on using um, and how much uh, pedal effort we're really targeting as well. So basically how we want the pedal to feel. 
and then we can add in also information about the tire sizes and down here this is all the braking components here well some of the braking components uh, the disc the pad and the uh, caliper piston sizes so this area here kind of lends itself to some trial and error or um, experimentation with different uh, out, uh, braking package setups in terms of uh, what's outboard uh, underneath the wheels. In the middle here it does some intermediate calculations that if you're interested you can find things in here like uh, the approximate pressures that you'd be uh, expecting from the targets that you've set out and then down the bottom we've got the results section here. So this results section um, the main thing it does here is recommends uh, master cylinder sizes to basically balance the system and give the best performance possible. Um, but if you understand how it all works and it's a bit more useful tool than that um, and you can play around with different master cylinder sizes and experiment with the um, braking components up the top as well and kind of use that to find a good system. You'll be able to uh, find out the approximate pedal travel that you'd get here and the pedal effort as well. And it'll also be able to provide some warnings uh, around things like hydraulic balance, uh, for example, if the master cylinders, uh, if we're using a motorsport style pedal box with dual master cylinders and a bias bar, the hydraulic balance is basically, if that's too different between the front and the rear circuit, the master cylinders will move through uh, two uh, Different, a big differential in travel, and we'll basically get a big tilt of that master cylinder. Ah, sorry, the bias bar, and that can cause issues with things like bias migration. So basically, where our brake bias moves throughout the brake application. Um, but down the bottom here is maybe the most helpful part, and that is our brake bias plot. So. What this shows, this black line through the middle here, kind of shows the uh, optimum or theoretical ideal brake bias for a vehicle. Uh, so that's the forward brake bias shown on the vertical axis here uh, over a range of different decelerations. So basically how hard we hit that brake pedal, how much weight we transfer. Um, the more we transfer weight onto the front tyres, the more front bias we're going to need. So that's why it slopes upward there. In this red range, uh, red area down the bottom here that would be too much rear bias and that's an area we generally want to stay out of as with the rear wheels locking first it makes the car want to rotate um, and become unstable and the grey area here would be too much front bias uh, front wheels locking first tends to understeer uh, more stable condition but not ideal and we're generally leaving a lot of braking performance on the table here somewhere in this green range is is pretty uh, spot on within about 7% of a theoretically ideal situation um, and this blue line here would be our actual braking bias that we're achieving from the components that we're putting in. So in this case we're using a proportioning valve um, and that's why we can kind of uh, approximate an ideal uh, brake bias over a range of different deceleration rates. Um, if it wasn't, if it didn't have the proportioning valve, it would just be straight across here. And obviously, if we have a bias bar, these uh, lighter blue lines here show the range of adjustment that we have with that bias bar. So you can clearly see uh, it's a really good tuning tool. But you're able to use this calculator to basically, um, yeah, dial in uh, or figure out from the input. Uh, the values from your vehicle, what will be at least a good starting point, get you in the ballpark, but you'd also be able to use this to uh, put in the values of your current setup and show how it kind of compares to what would be theoretically ideal um, and highlight some potential issues and then experiment with changes that you could make uh, to see how that would potentially fix it. Of course there's a lot more that goes into brake systems than just the calculations. There's a lot more factors involved and we cover those in the course as well. Just jumping back to the course, we also cover the practical skills, so things like brake bleeding and bedding, uh, upgrading calipers um, and tuning temperatures and just troubleshooting some common issues as well. There's an endless list of issues that you can have with brakes um, as they're usually one of the things that gives us the most headaches when we get out to the track especially with a factory braking setup. 
Um, so it's good to know all of that information and then we kind of condense everything down the bottom to HPA three-step process and that's just a good practice to follow for uh, brake system design um, if you are designing from scratch or analyzing an existing sys uh, setup as well. As well. So uh, we'll just leave it at that and I'll just get my notes together and then we'll crack on with the actual webinar. If you like that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up and if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.